Hello, everybody. Welcome to Fab 201, episode number two. If this is the first time you've been watching Fab 201, why don't you go watch episode one and then come right back here and enjoy episode two. If this is the second episode that you've been watching, welcome back. It's always nice to see you guys around. Today we're going to be talking about the decision tree. And in particular, we're going to use a game that I played recently, a Dorinthia Classic Constructed Mirror. And we're going to zoom in on one particular turn in the game. And we're going to analyze all the decisions on defense and on offense. Really analyzing the tactics of the turn. This episode is very closely related to the next episode, episode 3, in which we're going to talk about the game state, or the big picture, the strategy of the game. So this th this week we're going micro, we're focusing in on tactics, and then we're going to look at strategy and kind of the more big picture. All right, And that will be using a uh, rated Bolton game to illustrate that. All right, so we've been mentioning tactics and strategy quite a bit. Let's talk about those two words. All right, so let's talk a little bit about the relationship between tactics and strategy. So what is strategy and what is tactics? Well, strategy, in my definition, is the overarching plan for the game, whether that is playing generally as a control deck or to play as a combo deck. There should be some overarching idea uh, for what you're trying to do. So let's take a very simple example. Ira in Blitz is generally looking to play Kadachi Kadachi plus a four or five power attack card and make good use out of their Snapdragon Scalers on a critical turn. Um, that is generally their game plan, right? Tactics is referring to a more micro scale uh, concept. That is how you are executing your strategy on a turn to turn basis. So that means given this four card hand, how am I going to defend my opponent's attack? And how am I going to use the remaining cards in my hand to attack or to set up an arsenal card and continue the game? These two concepts are very, very closely linked and it is very important to realize that all tactical decisions in this game should be made within the reference or concept of your strategy. Oftentimes players end up playing turn to turn, hand to hand, with no consideration for what they're trying to do over many several many turns. So that's something to keep in mind. So when we're referring to the decision tree, what is the decision tree? Well, the decision tree is given your hand and given what your opponent is presenting to you in terms of their offense, assuming that you didn't strip every single card from their hand last turn, uh, you'll have to make some decisions on defense. So analyzing your hand on defense comes first. Why? Because you defend first in the turn cycle. That's just how it is, right? But it also needs to be, you need to take this uh, into account, you need to take into account that what you do on offense is very closely linked with what you do on defense. Oftentimes, you cannot, even if you have a good hand, you cannot afford to go on offense because maybe the on-hit effect is too threatening or your health is too low or there is some other, maybe you haven't set up a key combo piece like a time snap potion against Prism and it is just too risky to go for a five card hand against them because of arc like Sentinel, for example. So, so yeah, that's the decision tree. So right now we're going to take a look at a game between uh, myself and, a, and another Dorinthia, actually. This was a very rare situation where there was a classic constructed Dorinthia mirror. Um, but I think this illustrates a some very, very, very nice points here in relation to the decision tree. So we're going to 
when you're watching through the video, I want you to be thinking about what you would be doing with the four card hand that you're given, given the status of the game. All right. All right, guys, here is the situation of the game. So as you can see, I have this particular four card hand. I have Spoils of War, a blue hit and run, a red steel blade shunt, and a blue warrior's valor. It is my opponent's turn. They are attacking into me with a vanilla dawn blade for three. They currently have two resources floating, one card in arsenal, and their tunic is not charged. They currently have their bolters. All right. And the health is four to two with the hero having four to use some poker terminology. All right. So that is the situation of the game. Uh, a couple things also to be aware of here is that this is pretty late into the game. We have both gone down to maybe 15 cards or so. In terms of key cards here, I know that he has no more Sink Below, Fate Foreseen, or Steel Blade Shunt. As for my deck, I know that I have one more Sink Below and one more Yellow Shunt. My opponent is also running a Heart of Fendel. So that's another thing to keep in mind. All right, so what would you guys do in this situation? Have a think about what you would do when presented with an attack for three with two resources floating, one card in arsenal, and this four card hand to maximize the chance that you win this game. All right, so now that you guys have had a little bit of time to think about that, let me walk you through my thought process during this turn. So the number one thing that I was thinking about during this turn was that under no circumstance can I allow my opponent to hit me. The reason being is this game is so close. If he hits me, he's going to break his bolters. And that's going to be another card from my hand in addition to leaking damage. And he could even activate his bracers depending on what is in his arsenal. So this could become a very, very uh, nightmarish scenario if the first attack is allowed to hit. I will lose a massive amount of tempo if it is allowed to hit as well. So why must I maintain tempo in this game anyways, right? Well, in general, tempo is very, very important, but why is it very, very important in this particular case? Well, because I have one more yellow shunt left in my deck. So if I play my red shunt and I find my yellow shunt quickly, I can actually kill my opponent because he has two life left. My opponent has a hard offendal in his deck, so if he cycles to that quick enough, he'll be able to heal and get out of shunt range. And then if we both run if i run out of shunts and he finds his heart in a reasonable amount of time the game will continue and whoever has the tempo in that case will be uh will have a gigantic advantage all right the final consideration that i thought about is that keeping cards in my hand does not significantly improve my offense so the shunt doesn't Shunt being a defensive reaction does not allow me to attack with it. Although it can bluff a card, and that's something to consider, I didn't think that was worth it. So the, the end conclusion is that I must block. So now that we've gotten there, let's take the next step in the decision tree. Let's look at the... Now that I know that I have to block, let's calculate how much I have to block. Now... In some ways, Dorinthia is more complex and less complex than other heroes. It is more complex in that if you aren't familiar with uh, what she can do to you, you're going to have a very bad time. But once you understand the possibilities, you can logically narrow things down and take things a step at a time and then get to the correct decision. Uh, slowly. Whereas with other heroes, 
if they attack you with something with go again there's many possibilities for what could be coming next that's one of the uh one of the one of the nice things about playing Dorenthia is that generally she stays within this box but what she pulls out of the box you don't really know all right but this also allows us to analyze things very very logically so let's let's go through each of the possibilities given that the opponent has two resources floating and one card in hand or when, one card in arsenal sorry all right so the first situation is that my opponent has a plus three pump so there are several that exist in the game iron song response red stroke of foresight red out for blood red and raise reflex red now all three of those would take my opponent's attack up to six and none of them would be able to break through the red steel blade shunt so we're good there let's take a look at what happens if my opponent has a plus four pump well there are several situations that that can happen in so the first is that he plays singing steel blade and grabs a red iron song response well i know that there are no more red iron song responses in his deck because i have looked through his graveyard so that's not something i have to consider this is very late game the amount of possibilities has been reduced greatly all right the other possibility is he plays singing steel blade and grabs a one cost plus three pump like an out for blood or stroke of foresight which are still in his deck in that case that will leave him with no energy to attack again because he only has two resources okay the other possibility is he could have red biting blade now he he showed that he was playing blue biting blade earlier in the game so that is something that actually crossed my mind uh in this case if he plays a plays the two cost red biting blade similar situation he wouldn't have any energy to attack again all right so now we could cross that one out next what happens if he has a plus six pump well that it, that means a red overpower in this case he only has two resources floating so this is not not a possibility for him all right finally let's take a look at what if that card is route now this is the one that i was able to determine the first three pretty quickly on my turn but i had to think a little bit about what to do if this was route now blocking with a single three card cost or three block card from my hand would blow my opponent massively out if he tries to route that card because then i would shunt and block six against six right that would be a massive advantage for me however that blows that opens me up to a massive risk if he has a plus three pump or if he has a singing steel blade into a glint then i massively get blown out in this situation so that's not actually worth the risk so what about the other way to deal with route which is blocking with two cards well, if I block with two cards, there's, I mean, that's really unnecessary given that I have a red steel blade shot. So that's not even something I really considered. All right. So given all of these considerations, we can now come to a conclusion. So the conclusion is to say no blocks. All right. My opponent decided to pass on reactions and... This is not something that should come as any surprise, given the fact that if he passes on reactions and I pass on reactions, the end result is I take three damage, go down to one, he blows bolters, and he's very happy. Because not only am I at a very dangerous life total, he got to use his bolters. So obviously, if he has any reaction, especially one that requires reprise, he's just going to hold it here. So, I play my Red Steel Blade Shunt in response, pitching a blue hit and run, and that ends the turn. Alright, so hopefully you guys understood exactly how I got to this decision here. Now, ge generally you don't consider just the defense without looking at the offense. However, in this particular case, the defense was so important because blocking incorrectly here actually will lose the game uh that i looked at defense first and with 
higher consideration and almost in isolation. All right, but that's just keep in mind that you generally will look at offense in combination, right? Okay, so let's move on to the second part of the turn cycle, which is when we're on offense, all right? So now this is the updated uh, status. Because I played the shunt, my opponent dropped to one, and I don't no longer have those two cards, okay? So I have a red Spoils of War and a blue Warrior's Valor in my hand. How would you play this hand? Have a little bit of a think, and we'll be back in a little bit. All right, so uh, hopefully you determined that there were basically only two options here. Uh, the So let's talk about some considerations, all right? Option one is playing Spoils of War and swinging Dawnblade for five, all right? Simple enough. The other option is to hold Spoils of War, use the blue to pitch, and swing with one card in hand, all right? Those are the only two options, all right? The first situation, a swing for five demands a two-card block. Why? He has no more defense reactions, he has no more armor, and he's at one, right? So given that, I know that my opponent must block with two cards. That will give him two cards, plus an arsenal, plus a charge tunic, plus a bolters to attack me next turn. Not the greatest situation in the world. However, my deck still has a sink below. It still has a yellow shunt. All my cards block for three. And we could take a little bit of risk next turn if we need to. All right. So that's option one. Option two is to hold the spoils of war and swing for three. Now, from the opponent's perspective, they have three three options to respond to this. The first option, they could defend with a single three block card. In this case, they would, because they have no more defense reactions in, in their deck, they would die to any non-reprise, oh, actually they would die to, they would die to any reprise, <laughs> uh, pump in the game and they would survive any other situation right so if i have any way to add a damage here they're dead okay the second situation is if they block with two cards in this case they would because i've played two copies of route already they would actually die to the third copy of route because that would bring my attack up to six and their defense down to three right um but they would survive all other situations in this case, right? The other situation is if the if they block with all three cards. So if they block with all three cards, there's no situation in which one card and two energy can get over that, all right? So now, now that we have those two options put into play, let's think a little bit more. So option one is the better decision. Why? Well, for s several reasons. First of all, from the opponent's perspective, only option one and two makes sense. There's no way, there's no reason to play around that many cards, right? There's no way, there's no reason to take no risk at all in this situation, especially when you're behind, right? So the opponent is either going to block with one card or block with two cards. So option one is better because it does not give him the option to even possibly make the more superior or more optimal correct decision. If he blocks with one single card, calls my bluff, says, I don't think you have it. Well, then he's attacking me with three cards plus an arsenal. And that is a nightmare situation on just four life, right? Especially with bolters still available for him, all right? Let's say he goes with option two, blocks with two cards. Well, that's the same situation as, as option one, which is playing Spoils of War and then attacking, right? So in this case, 
I option one swinging for five is by far the the uh, superior decision here. So the game will continue in a more or less even game state because of the correct decisions that I made during the last turn cycle. Now, you'll notice that on defense or on offense, if I had made a single mistake during that turn cycle, during that tactics or micro uh, part of the game, I would have lost the macro or tempo part of the game, and then ultimately I would have lost the game, right? So this just uh, this just shows and highlights a little bit about the whole turn cycle, and I, re I think really, really zooming in on this uh, on this one particular turn was actually very, very interesting and illustrates many, many different concepts. All right, so let's go to the key takeaways now, okay? So each turn of the game, you must process the decision tree in relation to your overall game plan and the state of the game, all right? Every single decision you make should be taken in context of your overall game plan and what is going on in the game. You'll see that uh, in greater detail in episode three, where we talk about the macro state of the game and how each tactical decision, each turn cycle, contributes to the progression of the game plan given the game state all right so that's something to look forward to next time uh but this is just something to keep in mind in your games maybe in the next couple of weeks all right the second point i wrote here is that offense and defense are inseparable now that's just part of the game design here but this is also very very important to keep in mind is that your options on defense dictate what you're doing on offense right and Sometimes it's correct to work from offense to defense, and sometimes it's correct to work from defense to offense. In this particular example, we looked at the defense side of things first. Why? Because things were so precarious. The, the game was uh, in a situation where if, if he hits with his weapon, I get massively blown out and he gains a lot of tempo and I get really far behind, right? So I prioritize defense. Okay, that's not always the case. Let's say you have a channel mount heroic out, for example. If you have that out, then obviously you're way more incentivized to prioritize your offense and making sure your offense is smooth. However, with mid-range heroes such as Dorinthia and Bolton, they are really ones where you can go from defense to offense or offense to defense, right? So it kind of depends on your deck and the state of the game, right? The earlier in the game, the more you are to prioritize your offense. The later in the game, the more you are going to prior prioritize your defense. If you are more of a control deck, you are going to prioritize your defense first. If you're a more aggressive deck, you're going to prioritize your offense first, right? Either way, both of them uh, in are entwined together, and it's very, very important to take them, uh, to look at them both in the context of each other, okay? And the third point here that I just want to talk about is that forcing your opponent to do something is one of the strongest things that you can do in the game. That's one of the reasons why Command and Conquer is such a strong card, because it says, no, you don't get to play with a five card hand unless you have the fridge. If you have six armor points, all right, you can you can have your five card hand. But in general, you, you can't work with a five card hand if your opponent plays Command and Conquer. Similarly here, Forcing my opponent to block with two cards doesn't even give him the opportunity to make a play f with a single block, which would have caused me to get really, really far behind. All right. So being limiting your opponent's decision tree, even though it makes it a little bit easier for them to make a decision, is still a, a very, very strong tactic that you could employ. All right. So that basically wraps up things here. I hope that you guys enjoyed this episode of Fab 201. Next week, we're going to be talking about the macro game, and we're going to be looking at a game between Bolton and Dash, and we're going to look at the different stages of the game and 
and how the uh, overarching strategy progressed during the game. So that, I think you guys will really enjoy that. Uh, anyways, yeah, this is the uh, end of the episode, but I just wanted to say uh, thanks for watching, and if you have any suggestions uh, or improvements that I could make, I would... I'm all ears. I'm always uh, trying to trying to you know get better every day, as as the logo says. Uh, so yeah, hope you're having a great 2022, and I hope that you're you're doing well. You're happy, safe, and healthy. All right, and anyway, I hope you have a good day. See ya. But now, now the well, I guess is Arsenal card, right? Dang, man. Shunts are doing work on their life totals. I know, right? Wow. Still has two floating, by the way. So, that route's there. It is there. Nathan says Josh, that's game Josh has it. So, I'm curious if he's correct. I don't see it yet. I mean, and this is the, the, the you big just, ring you, moment. Do you just block with one card here? Oh no. Um, well, if you block with one card, his opponent has six um, at most, right? But he has the refraction bolters plus. Uh, yes, he could have route here, which is the big thing. If, if and... Josh doesn't have a defense reaction, this gets real tough. Well, I mean, he can still throw three, uh, throw three cards in front of it if he does have the route. Mm -hmm. um, I let him bounce back one. It's still at six, six six and six then he has a two card hand throwing three cards in front of a naked dawn blade would feel bad wouldn't it? it it would but sometimes you gotta do what you gotta do and then at that point his opponent probably wouldn't even play out the route he'd just be like oh thanks for the three cards oof opponent still has refraction bolt there's one block in his equipment and is the one attacking at the moment so and it's it's hard to say who's advantaged at the moment and this is the big big play <laughs> put him on better habit or play it safe and he's just wow saying... <laughs> nice very nice this is wow. just like a great time to have a steel blade shunt putting his opponent at one but that's the last shunt i believe for for josh Give me a deck count. I feel like I've seen these cards so many times. <laughs> we got 15 on his opponent and 17 Oh, here we Josh. go. We got spoils. This is going to get two cards out of hand. Mm-hmm. 